this channel has discussed many, many accidents at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. But we also like to share some of those that have seemingly been forgotten to time. These stories today come from Konstantin Sheffer, former deputy director of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, who has publicly released several documents about the history of the site. Without further ado, here are some of those forgotten Chernobyl accidents. The date is March 6th, 1978, and the head of the chemical workshop, Makarov, is on vacation, leaving Shishov in charge. Work must continue, and so Shishov ordered them to inspect a valve that connected the resin delivery line of an ion exchange filter, used to purify the water flowing through the core. Doing this required Shishov to clarify what safety measures needed to be taken. He did not, and simply expected the workers to do it just like it was any other day on the job. On March 7th, at 8.50am, work resumed. The shift supervisor, Milka, sent in a team to finally open the valve. First water gushed out, and then a radioactive resin that shot out and coated the workers. Obviously concerned about this, the chemical department called a dosimetrist. The dosimetrist found that the resin had a measured radioactivity of 0.07 rongens per hour, and the workplace had been contaminated to 0.02 rongens per hour. Their clothes measured 10 to the minus 6 becquerels per centimetre squared per minute. The dosimetrist was obviously concerned about this, and immediately told the workers to change clothes and barred them from working in the area. Despite this, the shift supervisor, Milka, ordered them to clean the room without changing their clothes, breaking four separate clauses of the safety regulations. In the end, this one incident has resulted in the overexposure of several workers, and large contamination of the premises and equipment. It was decided that the senior engineer of the chemical workshop, Shishov, and the shift supervisor, Melka, would not receive their monthly bonuses for what was considered a gross violation of safety. Who would have thought that a random order from Brokhanov in January would cause a dispute between two Soviet socialist republics in September? Well, that's actually what happened, believe it or not. Order of the director of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant number 9 dictated in January that the centralised repair shop would be performing maintenance on the vehicles of the waste collection service between September 4th and September 8th. As a result of this, waste at the central research centre began to build up. Containers were starting to overflow, and the laboratory technicians were getting concerned. It is unknown if they tried to organise an alternative waste collection service, but on September 10th, the deputy head of the centre, Shematova, ordered them to start pouring low-level liquid radioactive waste down the drains. As it turns out, these drains were maintained by the Belarusian SSR, who were not pleased to find out their sewage had mysteriously become radioactive. The waste was traced back to Shematova, who confessed and was strongly disciplined for this careless behaviour. Unrelated to the mentioned accident, Vitaly Zabarishchenko lost half his monthly bonus for the month by entering a clean environment while radioactively contaminated through an unused passage, which was technically off-limits on September 3rd. In September of 1978, Chernobyl Unit 1 had been launched, and after almost three years of service, the reactor needed to be shut down for major repairs on the block. This would require people working around the multi-forced circulation circuit, a big mouthful of words to represent all the piping that water flows through when going through the core and steam separators and whatnot. Inside these pipes, products of corrosion built up on the inside walls. These products were, in fact, radioactive, 
with high levels of gamma radiation reported. Because of this, the radiation levels around the circuit were elevated, and so they decided to decontaminate the entire circuit to protect the workers. This was advised by both the Kachatov Institute and Nikiet, the chief design organisation and engineering organisation respectively, and supported by a third organisation that oversaw Chernobyl, Soyuz Atomenergo. However, decontaminating these pipes was never actually envisioned by the designers when they planned the RBMK originally. The workers were basically on their own, but they had some experience from work at the Leningrad nuclear power plant. The idea was simple. Use a pipeline to transfer the wastewater from Unit 1 to the waste storage facility. And guess what? They had one. It ran underneath the walkway from the first two reactors to the waste storage facility. But it shouldn't have been used for this sort of transfer. It wasn't enclosed, above ground, and was meant for contaminated fluids. However, the workers just connected it to the system, and ran a decontamination fluid through the pipes, clearing them and sending everything out into the waste storage facility. Unfortunately, the pipe was not actually designed to withstand the pressure created when the waste was forced through. With the metal piping being exposed to 1.15 kilograms per square centimetre. And eventually, it gave way. A 40mm by 3mm crack in the pipeline tore open and the contamination solution gushed out, contaminating an area of 150 square metres, with levels on the ground reported at 1,000 microrongens per second, or 3.6 rongens per hour. I know someone will make a certain joke there, but I am not going to. The person responsible for this discharge, Shift Supervisor Milka, yes, the same guy from the first accident I mentioned, was the first person to discover the leak, and reported it to Makarov, the head of the chemical workshop mentioned, who was on, ho who was on holiday in 1978 when the first accident occurred. Now, Makarov had many options here. He could have stopped the flow of the solution, or immediately closed off the area. But instead, he looked for reasons that it wasn't the fault of the chemical shop, but the reactor shop. Someone was sent to check on the site and record the levels, but they didn't finish their examination. The pipe was left discharging water overnight into April 20th. By the time the accident was actually reported, on April 21st, the important matter of the radioactive contamination was not included by the reporter, who considered it beyond their job description to mention it. Only when people went to repair the damage did they realise that yes, there was significant contamination. A week after the accident had started, April 26th, 1981, the site had been fully decontaminated by four shifts working six hours in the morning and the evening. And the investigation was quickly finished by April 30th. In their report, the investigators concluded that virtually all the people involved either did not take responsibility for the accident, nor did they act in a manner to ensure the safety of the workers during the decontamination process, although no significant overexposures were reported. Yet again, Milka did not receive his monthly bonus, nor did Makarov, among many others that were held responsible. This accident is incredibly small, but is listed anyway. From 4pm on May 19th, 1981, to 8am on May 20th, Shift 2 and 4 was sent to decontaminate Room 038 Stroke 2 inside Chernobyl Unit 1 a room filled with piping heading from the pumps towards the reactor. The floor cladding, after four years of operation, was apparently in desperate need for repair. 
Shift 2 started first, and they focused on cleaning the large debris, turning up wires, bolts, electrodes, gloves, etc., and placed it in containers for Shift 4 to deal with. Shift 4 then went in at midnight, swept the floor of room 038 stroke 2, and washed it using a hose. At 8am, they left the room, but apparently forgot to remove the containers from Shift 2. At 9am, dosimetrists examined the transport corridor, a long rail line running inside the building, when they came across what appeared to be a torn paper bag. This was one of the containers that Shift 2 had used for decontamination, and now its metallic contents were spilled out into the corridor. The dosimetrists measured 3.6 rongens per hour. Again. Anyway, the accident report criticised the weak dosimetric control on both shifts, reprimanding the supervisors and deducting their monthly bonuses. Chernobyl Unit 1 is shut down for maintenance, when a leak was detected in the plug of channel 2431. A channel that didn't contain a fuel rod or a control rod, but a DKER detector, used to monitor conditions inside the reactor core. In order to replace the seal of the plug, first the electrical connector to the DKER sensor has to be disconnected, and then the sensor itself has to be remotely removed from the channel. At 9.35pm on June 23rd, 1981, the man in charge, Vasev, told another employee, Kursky, to disconnect the electrical connector of the DKER sensor. Kursky passed the job on to Zhuravlev, instructing him about the timing of the operation, and asked him if he knew how to do it, which Zhuravlev said he did. Zhuravlev then seek the help of Kapustin, as he was unable to locate it on his own. Once they found it, the two of them lifted off the cap of the channel and then disconnected the electrical connector. Job done, right? Unfortunately not. You see, the two decided to keep going, and, in gross violation of every conceivable guideline in place, decided to ignore the fact that the sensor had to be removed remotely. Instead, they manually lifted the DKER sensor out of the core, their only protection being their work clothes and some cotton gloves. The second they did, dosimetric alarms were triggered in the dosimetry control room, leading to the evacuation of the central control room, the control room of Reactor 1, and the Reactor 1 reactor hall. Fortunately, their doses seemed to be quite small, all things considered. Zhuravlev received a dose of 2.8 millisieverts, a little less than what the average American receives in a single year. Kapustin received even less, just a single millisievert, or the maximum radiation dose a non-nuclear worker in the USA or Canada can legally receive. Both men were severely reprimanded, had to complete refreshers on their radiation safety training, alongside general training of all Reactor 1 employees, and lost their monthly bonuses. <laughs>